Hello and welcome to this episode of This Is Your Life. My name is Michael Hyatt and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership. My goal is to help you live with more passion, work with greater focus, and lead with extraordinary influence. In this episode, I'll be talking about the lost art of note-taking, and I'll be talking about why it's important to take notes in the meetings you attend and how you can do it more effectively. Whether it's plain old paper notes or the latest digital devices, I've got you covered. But first, this podcast is brought to you by Platform University, an online membership site for helping you launch your personal platform or take it to the next level. You can find out more at platformuniversity.com, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about it at the end of this podcast, so stay tuned. So let's get right into this episode. You know, when I was in the corporate world, I spent most of my life in meetings. I literally had meetings from the time I hit the office until I drove off at night, and that's not quite the case anymore since I've become a full-time author and speaker, but I still spend a considerable amount of time in meetings, and Not every day like I used to, but certainly numerous times a week. And for me, note-taking has and continues to be a survival skill. Yet I'm surprised at how few people bother to take notes in meetings. And that's always struck me wrong. And I'll try to articulate why here as we go through this. But I've sat in meetings where I seem to be the only one taking notes. And by the way, I was pleasantly surprised when I sat down with Craig Cooper and Howard Varnado last week for lunch. These are two guys I had just met. They read my blog, listened to my podcast, and had just moved uh, to Franklin, Tennessee, where I live. And they'd asked to have lunch with me, and I agreed. And, you know, to be honest, usually when I do this, I regret it. Too many people come unprepared, and it's often a waste of my time. But these guys not only came with a list of questions that were written out, but they also took notes furiously as we were talking. So kudos, guys. You really impressed me. That's what I like to see. So anyway, I'm surprised at how few people bother to take notes in meetings. And those who do often express frustration at how ineffective the exercise seems to be. So let's start at the top by answering the question, why? Why take notes in meetings? And let me give you five reasons why you should take notes in every meeting you attend. Reason number one, note-taking enables you to stay engaged. Now, I've had a lot of people that called and said, look, when I'm taking notes, I can't be engaged. I can only be taking notes. I don't think that's the case if you practice note-taking. The real benefit is not what happens after the meeting, but during the meeting itself. And if I don't take notes, my mind wanders. I daydream. And as they say, the lights are on, but no one's at home. But when I take notes, I find that I stay more alert, more focused, actively involved, and my contribution to the meeting is thus more likely to add value to the topic under discussion. And that's why I take notes, even if someone is officially taking notes. I used to, in the old days, I had my assistant take notes in meetings, take the minutes, but I would still take notes because it was a way of keeping my mind involved in the task at hand. It's also why I never provide a handout with all the notes before I speak. I might provide an outline with some of the blanks. I might even provide all the notes after I speak, but I never, ever provide all my notes before. And the reason is that this causes people to run ahead of the present and not really listen. And it also cheats people out of the opportunity to gain their own insights, which often happens in the process of taking notes. So note-taking enables you, I believe, to stay focused. Reason number two, Note-taking provides a mechanism for capturing ideas, insights, and questions. You know, not everything can be resolved in the meeting. Some ideas require incubation. Some insights require further exploration or follow-up. And some questions require further research. Regardless, note-taking provides a way for you to capture the content of the meeting so that you can process it after the meeting. So reason number two, note-taking provides a mechanism for capturing ideas, insights, and questions. Reason number three, note-taking helps you track assignments, yours and others. In most meetings, people make commitments. I mean, this happens all the time. These include projects, due dates, or other follow-up. But when people leave the meeting, you know what happens. You've been there. They may head straight into another meeting, 
or they sit down in their office to a full email inbox. It's almost as if um, everything is designed to distract you and keep you from fulfilling the commitments you made in that last meeting. So the only way to get uh, beyond that is to take notes, to provide a way for yourself to record assignments and track them so they don't, uh, sort of, so to speak, dissipate into the ether. Reason number four, note-taking provides a handy reference weeks and months later. I don't know about you, but I can hardly remember what I did today, let alone last week or last month. And it's not a function of my age, I promise. It's a result of having more to do than we can manage. It's true for all of us. We've got to have a mechanism in order to take notes, in order to capture our best thinking in those meetings. And fortunately, that assistance is available in the form of note-taking. I can't tell you how many times note-taking has saved my proverbial bacon, not only when trying to resolve a dispute, but in holding people accountable and in getting back to some key insight I didn't want to forget, but did. So reason number four, note-taking provides a handy reference weeks and months later when your memory has failed you. Reason number five, note-taking communicates the right things to the other attendees. This is probably my favorite reason of all. When someone takes notes, it communicates to everyone else that they're actively listening. It also communicates that um, what others are saying is important. It's worth making the effort to record their insights. And if you're in a leadership position, it also subtly establishes accountability. Your people think, gosh, if the boss is taking it down or writing it down, he probably intends to follow up. I better pay attention. And as a leader, your example speaks volumes. If you take notes, your people will likely take notes. And if you don't, it's likely they won't. You set the pace as the leader. I noticed this when uh, Mark Schoenwald, who is my successor at Thomas Nelson, the current CEO, came to work for me. He took copious notes in every meeting he attended, whether it was in a one-on-one meeting with me, an executive team meeting with his peers, or a larger company meeting. He just wrote and wrote and wrote. He wasn't wasn't anything fancy. He just used a yellow legal pad, but everyone noticed. It communicated he was listening. It communicated respect that the other people who were talking had something that was so important uh, in what they said that he, it was worth him taking note of it and writing it down. And it also subtly established accountability. And by the way, this is one of the reasons I sat right in the front at the platform conference, if you were there, and took notes on every single speaker. Not only did I want to stay engaged in the meeting, not only did I want to capture the best ideas and questions and action items, but I also wanted to communicate to the other people there that uh, that they needed to be taking notes, and this was worthy or noteworthy. Where do you think that phrase came from? It was noteworthy. Okay, so there's probably other reasons. Those five will get you started. These are the main ones. And now I want to turn to how. How can you take better notes? And I'm going to share with you some of my practices, and I'm not suggesting that these will be the best for you. Note-taking is a highly, highly personal practice. My goal is simply to stimulate your thinking and get you to be more intentional with whatever tools you select and process you use. So with that in mind, here are five suggestions for better note-taking. Number one, suggestion number one, don't get hung up on the tool. Um, Anything is better than nothing. There's no right tool. The best tool for you is the one you'll use consistently, okay? So I, I know people that go on a quest for the perfect tool. They spend a lot of time testing all kinds of applications, testing all kinds of Uh, processes, but at the end of the day, the one that is the best for you is the one you'll use consistently. Uh, And that may be different for you than it is for me, but here's what I do. On the phone, when I'm on a phone call, whether one-on-one or on a conference call or a Skype call, I use Evernote. You've heard me talk about Evernote a lot of times, and uh, it's a tool that I really believe in. It's free. There is a premium account that you can buy, but basically it's free. But I use it for almost everything. I use it as my digital brain, and I use it when I'm on a conference call or I'm talking with someone one-on-one. And here's what I do. I set up a specific note for that call. I just use one note per call, and I use the date in the title with a brief description about what the subject was of that particular call. So for example, just a couple from the last few weeks, 
I entered 2013-03-22. And by the way, I always enter the year first and then the month and then the date. So they sort, if I want to sort them by title, they sort uh, in chronological order. So 2013-03-22 coaching call with Rabbi Evan Moffick. Here's another one. 2013-03-22, same day, dash weekly management meeting. This is a weekly management meeting that I have with Brian and Joy, and I take notes on that meeting as they do as well. Here's another one. 2013-03-15 pre-event conference call with Dan Miller. I'm speaking at Dan's Innovate conference later this week, and so I just recorded uh, the notes I had with him as I talked about or talked with him about what he wanted me to talk about, uh, what I needed to wear, uh, the slide equipment that would be available, et cetera, et cetera. So I kept notes on that uh, phone call. But these kinds of notes all go in my general, what I call cabinet notebook. And I used to use an elaborate set of notebooks in Evernote. Now I basically use one and I use multiple tags. And This provides uh, a lot more flexibility since a note can only live in one notebook at a time, but a note can have multiple tags so that if you cover a lot of different subjects uh, over the course of a phone call, you don't have to worry about which notebook to categorize it in. You can simply tag it with the appropriate categories and get back to it in that way. I also tag every meeting uh, like this with the tag meeting notes. So that's where I'm going to find all my meeting notes is in that tag. And if it's a meeting with one of my staff, I'll also tag it with their name. So if I want to get back to all my notes with Joy, I can just go to the tag Joy and find all my notes that I've had with her. So that's what I do if I'm on the phone, whether it's one or one or a conference call, I use Evernote. If it's a face-to-face meeting, I do one of two things. If I know the people well, like if I'm meeting actually face-to-face with Brian and Joy or somebody else on my team, Megan, I had a lunch appointment with her today. She's my daughter. I will go ahead and use Evernote. I'll just pull out my laptop and take notes in Evernote. There's going to be no miscommunication that I'm disengaged or I'm checking email when I should be listening to them. They know I'm taking notes in Evernote. If I don't know them well, I pull out my iPad mini and I take notes in the Moleskina or Moleskin application, however you want to pronounce that. By the way, yes, I'm familiar with the Penultimate application, which is now owned by Evernote and it's terrific. I don't use it. But uh, you should feel free to use whatever tool you like best. As I said earlier, don't get hung up on the tool. And by the way, I use the Jot Pro Stylus for taking notes. The reason I use the iPad mini is because I feel like pulling out my computer just feels more intrusive. I I do think, and and maybe this is a holdover, you know, from the uh, pre- mobile device era, but I, I just feel like it's it's intrusive and it looks like maybe I am doing something other than taking notes. And I don't want people to wonder if they've got my full, full attention. So I take out the iPad, I jot on that just as I would if I were taking a paper note. I'm looking up occasionally at them. I'm nodding. I'm making, letting them know that I am engaged in the conversation. So again, people don't have to wonder if I'm uh, paying attention or not. And for some reason, a phone doesn't work for me. Uh, I feel like that looks like I'm checking my email or doing Twitter or something else that I shouldn't be. So I want to use the iPad mini. And if I wasn't using that, I would be using a paper uh, planner like the Moleskina uh, journal, which I used for years. And now I'm using the iPad mini in its place. If I'm at a conference, I'll just take written notes in the conference notebook and then I'll scan them into Evernote later. And by the way, if you want to use a traditional paper journal, that's fine, by the way. You, you aren't any more cool if you use a digital device than, than if you don't. Although I, I think sometimes it's a little easier to get back to your notes if you take them in something like Evernote. But if you want to use a traditional paper journal, great. I recommend the Ecosystems Journal. It's what I was using before I started using Evernote on the iPad mini. But it's just like the Moleskine notebook, except that, get this, all the pages are perfed making it easy to tear out the pages and then scan them into Evernote. And by the way, Evernote will index your words. It uses an optical recognition uh, software, so it will actually index the words that are in your handwritten notes, which is pretty cool. So again, suggestion number one, don't get hung up on the tool. Suggestion number two, record whatever you find interesting. Now, caveat, there's always something interesting. I've made it my purpose to become 
fascinated with other people and with what they're saying. And this, I find, is often a decision that I need to make. It's not dependent on the other person. Being bored is not an option for me. And in the process, I might record any or all of the following things. The outline the speaker is using, the questions that are being asked or addressed, the key insights I have independent of what is being said, the illustrations, the anecdotes, the diagrams, the quotes, any and all of the above are uh, candidates for me to record in Evernote or in my journal. And if you find yourself bored, then take notes on that too. I've done this before. Gosh, why am I bored? Is it you or is it them? What can I do now to engage? I kind of make a game of it, but I want to stay fascinated and stay interested in the topic because it certainly makes it a much better meeting if I'm engaged than if I decide to disengage because the speaker's kind of disengaged and then we're just wasting uh, everybody's time. So I want to stir it up. Sometimes, I, I tell you, I used to do this when I was the CEO. Sometimes I would kind of throw a discussion grenade right in the middle of the conversation if the meeting was a little bit slow, but just kind of stir it up and get everybody thinking. I'm not sure that's a good practice or not, but it often worked in a meeting that was a little bit slow. So suggestion number two, record whatever you find interesting. Suggestion number three, give your notes structure, even if the meeting or the presenter is unstructured. Now, hopefully all your meetings that you're participating in have an agenda. And I think that's so important and so much time is wasted in meetings because somebody hasn't thought through what the meeting objective is and what the agenda needs to be. And you can avoid a lot of wasted time by just doing that for the meetings you're responsible and trying to foster a culture that does that in your organization as well. But according to the Journal of Reading, the most rigorously structured notes, those with hierarchical ordering and numbered subsections were the highest quality and accuracy. And if nothing else, use bullets or numbers. And I generally use subheads so that when the topic changes, I've got a subhead that notes it so that when I go back to review, I can quickly scan and find out where we were in the discussion. So suggestion number three, give your notes structure, even if the meeting or the presenter is unstructured. Suggestion number four, use symbols so you can quickly scan your notes later. Now, let me start by telling you what I used to do in a written journal, because I think it'll serve as an analog for what I do in my digital journal now, or my digital notes. I used to, in a written journal, indent my notes from the left edge of the paper about half an inch, and that allowed me to put symbols in the left-hand margin, and I used four. If an item was particularly important or insightful, I put a star next to it. You could also underline it, but I just used a, a star. That was kind of my standard symbol for denoting something that was important or insightful. If an item required further research or resolution, I put a question mark next to it. And again, not at the end of the sentence, but in the left-hand margin at the beginning of the item where I had a question. If an item requires follow-up, I put a ballot box, like an open square next to it. And when the item is completed, then I would check it off. And that way I could tell which items were still open in my notes and which items had been closed out because I had completed that specific action. If I'd assigned a follow-up item to someone else, I put an open circle next to it, similar to the ballot box, but a circle rather than a square. And in the notes, I indicated who is responsible. And then when the item was completed, I also checked that off. And um, I have a diagram of this at michaelhyatt.com forward slash note symbols. And that's a slide that I use when I uh, teach on this topic. michaelhyatt.com forward slash note symbols. And there'll be a link in the show notes to this. Okay, so here's what I do in Evernote because it's not possible to use those uh, same symbols and search for them. There's just not the equivalence uh, digitally. And this is, this is one of the things I would love to see Evernote add in the future is some basic uh, note-taking symbols like this that we could use. But if an item is particularly important or insightful, I put the word Z, small letter K, Z is in zebra, Z important, all one word next to it. That way I can search for Z important and find it. And you can also underline it or make it bold, but that's not going to be searchable. So again, Z important. If an item requires further research or resolution, I put the word Z question, lowercase Z, uppercase Q, Z question next to it. And again, then I can search by that particular odd word and find uh, all the questions that I have for my notes. If an item requires follow-up, 
I just use the standard Evernote to-do character, you know, the little ballot box that you can insert right into an Evernote note. And those actually are searchable. If you go up to the search bar and search to-do, and then you can put a colon for true if it's checked or false if it's not, or leave it blank and you'll find all your to-dos. But I just use the to-do character. If I've assigned a follow-up item to someone else, I just use the standard Evernote to-do character followed by the person's name. Again, I don't like it as well as uh, what I used to use in the written world, but it's the best I've been able to find with Evernote. And I save those as saved searches in Evernote so I can find all those items quickly. So suggestion number four is use symbols so you can quickly scan your notes later and in your processing find uh, what you need to find quickly. Suggestion number five, schedule time to review your notes. This is the secret. I scan my notes immediately after the meeting if possible. Now, that's not always possible, but if possible, I do it right after the meeting. If that's not possible, I do it at the end of my workday. If that's not possible and if I miss several days, I do it during my weekly review on Sunday evenings. Regardless, I take action on those items that I can do in less than two minutes. This is David Allen's two-minute rule. If you can take action on something in your notes or something in your inbox in two minutes or less, do it right then. Don't go through the hassle of transferring it to a task management system. It's more trouble than it's worth. Just do it. If not, then I transfer the to-do items to Nosby, which is my task management system, and there I can track it and make sure that it gets done. And by the way, it's also a good idea to review your notes before the next meeting. It'll get you up to speed on where you last left the project or the topic. So that's how I uh, schedule time to review my notes. So the method you use is secondary to the importance of doing it. Don't get hung up on the process or the method. Be intentional, use something, and improve it over time, and feel free to experiment. The key thing is to be intentional. So with that, let's get to some listener questions. The first one comes from Brandon. Hello, Michael. My name is Brandon Jones, and I'm calling from Victorville, California. My website is leadershipdoneright.com. One of my biggest challenges with note-taking in meetings is that when I take extensive notes, my head is down and my contribution is limited. If I don't take notes, I'm an active participant in the meeting. Do you have any recommendations for how to be an active meeting contributor while still effectively taking notes? Thank you very much. Brandon, this is a great question. In fact, it was so good that I had about 10 of them just like it. Evidently, a lot of people struggle with this. You know, for me, it enables me to stay more engaged by taking the notes. And the issue may be that people think I may may be disengaged, but I look up occasionally. I look at the person who's speaking or the person who's talking. I'll nod. Um, I might ask a question. I participate in the conversation. And if I miss something, I just catch up. I don't know. It's not that uh, difficult for me, but I do think you have to make an effort to stay engaged in the meeting. And you might have to set your pencil down to really engage in the conversation. But again, you know, you're not you're not a, a stenographer or a court secretary. You're not trying to capture every word. You're just trying to stay engaged and and capture enough of the meeting that it will be useful to you later on. So hopefully that helps. The next question comes from Kerry. Hi, Michael. This is Kerry Branscombe at kerryperks.wordpress.com. I guess my question is, what is the one favorite pen or pencil you have to you enjoy the most? What's the most enjoyable and the best and perhaps the fastest for note-taking? Thank you. Kerry, my favorite pen, and this is uh, an analog pen, a real pen that writes on paper, is the Mont Blanc ballpoint pen. I mean, that is such a comfortable pen. It's so easy to write with. I've used it for years and years and years. Unfortunately, they're very expensive, but they make a great gift. And most of the ones that I've ever had, uh, and I've had a few, have been given to me as gifts. But Mont Blanc is, is my favorite. For the digital world, I've tried, I think, almost every stylus that's out there. And and I did it with the excuse that I would would try to figure this out for my readers. So I, I bought almost all of them and tested them and used them for a couple of weeks. But the one I like the best is the Jot Pro. It has a very fine stylus and a little uh, circle at the bottom of it. You have to just to, to see it to know what I'm talking about, but a sphere almost so that it will register on the iPad, but it gives you the sense like you're writing with a fine tipped instrument. And so that's my favorite right now. Thanks. Great question. Next one comes from Deborah. 
Hi, Michael. My name is Deborah Owen from Massachusetts, and thanks to you and Platform University, my fledgling education blog is at convergenceinthecommons.com. As a high school library teacher, I notice that if given a choice, many students simply copy and paste in order to take notes. So I do teach them how to take notes from something they're reading, but I think you're talking about notes from meetings. From the perspective of an employer, do you have any suggestions for teachers and librarians in terms of the kinds of note-taking that we should be teaching that will be especially useful for our students when they enter the workforce? Thanks for including this question. I'll look forward to your answer. Deborah, this is a terrific question. I think if we're going to be competitive in the next generation, we've got to teach the kids that are under our charge how to take notes and how to be efficient and how to be effective at doing so. So, you know, one of the things you might do is just go through the principles that I've outlined here and let them practice, do some role playing, and then evaluate what they've done, make suggestions for improvement, but require it in your classes. This is a gift that will keep on giving. And if you can teach your students how to do this, it will serve them so very well in their adult lives and in the corporate world and even in the nonprofit world. So thanks for a terrific question. The next one comes from Eric. Hey, Michael, this is Eric Ream. I blog at ericream.com. I'm from Bloomington, Indiana. I like to listen to podcasts while I, I am on the move. A lot of times when I'm running or working out or when I'm in the car and I'm traveling, the problem is, is I hear a lot of great information, a lot of different things I want to follow up on. But by the time I get uh, back from my run or when I get done with my travels, I uh, haven't uh, written anything down or I forgot what are some of the things that I learned. And so I don't have an effective system yet in place to capture all those great ideas. I know that you like to listen to podcasts and things like that when you're working out and traveling. I want to see if you had some kind of tips or tricks or system that you use to help you uh, take notes or effectively capture information after you've listened to some of these podcasts after a run or when you're traveling. Look forward to hearing your thoughts, Michael. Thanks for all you do. Love Platform University. Eric, I'm afraid the short answer is no. <laughs> I don't have a very good system for that. And I'm not sure that anyone does. I don't, just don't think the technology is there. I wish I could be listening to a podcast or listening to an audio book and just think to myself, yeah, underlight that or highlight that. And somehow it would be magically captured and saved in Evernote or saved in some other format. But right now, that's just not possible. Now, I'll tell you a little bit of a mental hack that I use, and that is I will repeat the thing that I want to remember out loud. So maybe it's a sentence, maybe it's a, a to-do item or an action item that I want to follow up on, but I'll just stop what I'm listening to and say out loud what it is. And then when I get back home or back to the office after I've uh, been listening in the car or working out, then I'll write that thing down. Now, unfortunately, sometimes I do forget the other thing I do too is a lot of the books that I listen to on audio, I also buy physical copies of that or buy the Kindle and then I'll underline, go back through the chapter. Just happened this morning. I'm reading a book called The Ultimate Sales Machine and a terrific book, by the way. I would have never bought this because the title just didn't seem like it would apply to me, but it's a terrific book by Chet Holmes. And so I listened to a chapter that was terrific on training. And then when I got home, I opened that chapter and underlined the parts of it that were important to me. And it was a lot faster than rereading the chapter. So I didn't have to do that. But again, I don't have a terrific solution. If somebody else does, I'd love for you to, uh, to leave a comment uh, for all of us so that we can learn. The next question comes from Jared. Hey, Michael, this is Jared Easley from starvethedoubts.com. What's your advice on taking mental notes? I sometimes run into scenarios where I don't have a pen and it's inappropriate to use a mobile device. Do you have a best practice for mental note-taking? Thanks. Jared, my answer to you is really the same as I answered to Eric. I don't have a good system for that. I try to be really, really sure that I don't end up in meetings without something on which to take notes. My iPad mini goes with me everywhere. And in uh, bigger meetings, as I noted earlier, I'll take out my laptop and actually take notes directly into Evernote. But I rarely get caught in that situation. Now, the situations where maybe I only have a phone, and it doesn't seem appropriate to try to take a note on my phone. Yeah, I don't. I do what I said to Eric is I just try to remember it mentally. I might say it to myself out loud after the meeting, but I don't know of a better system than that. If you've got one or somebody else has one, let us know. The next question comes from Jeremy. Hey, Michael. My name is Jeremy Jones from Scottsdale, Arizona, and my blog is askjeremyjones.com. I have a question about the note-taking 
I consider myself a life learner, so I, I take a lot of classes and uh, educate myself a lot. And so I have lots and lots of notes. And as of recently, I've got into the habit of taking maybe two action steps from that seminar and finding some way I can apply them into my life. I'm wondering, when you're taking notes, do you have a regular system or a process that you use to make sure you put the notes that you take on a regular basis into action in your life? Thanks again, Michael, for everything that you do, and I'm uh, looking forward to the next podcast. Thanks. Jeremy, the short answer is yes, I do. And I use those symbols, as I mentioned. And if there's something that I want to apply out of what I've been listening to or something that I want to do as a result of what I've been exposed to, I do create a task for myself or a to-do in Evernote, and then I make sure that gets transferred to Nosby for follow-up and integrated into the rest of the tasks that I have to do. The next question comes from John. John Brubaker. My website is coachbrew.com. My question is, how do you get buy-in from people who work for you to become note-takers themselves without forcing it on them? Thank you. John, if I could just broaden your question, I think the question is really how do you create cultural change in any organization? It may be note-taking, it may be something else, but the only way I've found to do that or the best way I've found to do that is, number one, make sure that you are practicing the behavior you're trying to get other people to follow. You are the best uh, the best living advertisement of that behavior. And if you're not willing to do it, you're not going to get other people to do it. You've got to practice it. And assuming that you've got uh, a life worthy of emulation, something that other people uh, find attractive, then it's probably not going to catch hold in your organization. Second thing, though, is in addition to practicing, I would talk about it. Explain the reasons why. Make the case. Teach people. Don't just assume that people show up with this stuff uh, already pre-built into their system. They don't. They're not learning this in school, unfortunately. They probably didn't learn it on the last job they had. And unless you take the time to instruct them, explain why, and show them how, they're probably not going to get it. But most importantly is to model it. That's where it starts. The next question comes from Jordan. Hello, Michael. My name is Jordan Collier. I blog at evernoteforstudents.wordpress.com, and you can find me on Twitter at jcolliera. I'm an English teacher, and as you can probably guess by my blog title, I'm a big believer of note-taking to save thoughts and ideas. I encourage my students every day to use Evernote, and I wrote the Evernote Student Handbook, which is available on my blog, to teach students great ways to use Evernote for school. While I'm a very detailed and almost obsessed note taker, I do have a question regarding reflection. I enjoy going back from time to time and reading some previous journal entries, book highlights, and other past notes, but I don't have a reflection system in place. Do you have any tips or a system you could recommend to help me make better use of my notes? Thanks. Jordan, to be honest, I don't really have a good system for reviewing or reflecting on my notes other than what I said earlier, and that's to review immediately after the meeting at the end of the day, or in my weekly review. I find, though, that the real value of note-taking, most of it happens in the process of taking the notes itself. So even if I weren't, even if I don't go back and review it, that's okay. At least it's there in my system if I need to get back to it. But I don't really have a system. If someone else could recommend one, that would be great. Thanks. The next question comes from Paula. Hi, Michael. My name is Paula Gibson, and I am calling from Colorado. I don't have a blog. I'm just a mom trying to raise her children to be servant leaders. I'm curious about in this generation of tablets and smartphones, where many students are not actually writing much with pen and pencil, what are some ways we can actually encourage them to be taking notes? Thanks. I look forward to your answer. Bye. Well, Paula, first of all, I have to take exception to your description of yourself. You said, I'm just a mom trying to raise the next generation of servant leaders. I mean, that's a heroic, enormous undertaking. And I just want to say thanks for all you're doing uh, to do that because it's a very, very important role. I would say that I'm not a traditionalist when it comes to note taking. I don't think there's anything more inherently virtuous in using paper and pen to take notes. I mean, that just happened to be yesterday's technology. Before that, you know, it was papyrus and, you know, a quill. But uh, today... It's digital devices, and I would say embrace the technology. There's lots of technologies out there, lots of applications for students, and I would just explore those and embrace them and find out if there's not something that might actually be better for the kids to use and keep them more engaged 
and make them uh, feel like they're they're more current than just using paper and pen. So I would you know just try something. The next question comes from Scott. Hi, Michael. This is Scott McFadden from Arlington, Texas. I wanted to get your thoughts on the use of digital note taking in a business setting. Now with iPads and the several note taking apps that are available, many people show up to meetings with iPads. How would we be able to use iPads to take notes versus a physical piece of paper or notebook and not look disengaged or uninterested in what's being said? We don't want to convey that we're not interested or we're surfing the web or playing Angry Birds or something like that. Would appreciate your insight and thank you for all that you do. Scott, thanks for that question. I think I've, I've kind of answered that in some of the other questions and actually in the main contest uh, content of the podcast, but you've got to act engaged as well as taking the notes. But I think you just have to talk about this in your culture. You have to uh, talk about the temptation perhaps to be distracted, but give people permission to use their digital devices, talk about what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, and help them learn how to use these devices in an appropriate way. The, 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 the truth is they're not going away. So we might as well learn how to incorporate them into our business life and use them in an effective manner. The next question comes from Tom. Michael, this is Tom McFarland of Raleigh, North Carolina. My question is, what do you do with your notes, the raw material, after you finish processing them? Do you put them into Evernote? Do you scan them into some other system? Do you keep the file folders? What happens to the raw material after you've gleaned the nuggets from those notes? Many thanks for taking my question. Tom, I keep them. You know, I'm looking over here at a shelf in my study where I've got a whole shelf that's devoted to the notebooks, the physical notebooks that I've used through the years, which are a great treasure trove. Uh, It's just kind of fun occasionally to go back and and look through the notes that I took at various points in my career, but I, I keep them. And even after I've processed them, and of course, now I'm entering almost everything into Evernote from the get go. And so, yeah, I'm keeping them there as well. For a brief period, I was taking my notes in the ecosystems journal, and then I was pulling those out. They were perfed, and so I would take them out and scan them into Evernote, and then I would literally throw the pages away because I didn't have a, a good mechanism for holding those together once I removed them from the notebook. But I think if you can keep them, it's great. It's a great way to uh, look back and, and see what your journey has been in your career and so forth. So anyway, those are my thoughts. The last question comes from Victor. My name is Victor Manzanilla and I blog about leadership on liderazgoi.com. My question is the following. I am good taking notes, but not that good archiving and indexing my notes so I can create a repository that is searchable in the future, especially when I take notes on paper. I haven't been able to successfully use my iPad for taking notes. Could you please share your process for archiving and searching? Additionally, I found a product called a smart pen that you can write on paper and it will sync everything you write to Evernote. Have you used that product? Not sure if it's good or bad for this note-taking process. Thank you, Michael. Victor, I wasn't very good at this either when I was taking physical notes. And I I read all kinds of systems from people who actually would, would transfer the topics and create manually a written index of all their notes for the month. I just never had the discipline or the time to do that effectively. But the great thing is, is that if you use a digital system like an Evernote system, they're automatically archived and indexed and fully searchable. So if that's what you're after, I, I, would, I wouldn't go through the brain damage of trying to do this with a physical system. I would just get into the digital world and use something like Evernote. So that's the last question. I want to ask one for you, and that is, what have you found helpful in taking notes? Share your best tips with us, and you can leave your comment at michaelhyatt.com forward slash 047, as in episode 47. Just three quick announcements here at the end of this episode. I'm speaking at Dan Miller's Innovate Conference on Friday, the March, March the 29th here in Franklin, Tennessee, and I'm speaking on the topic of platform, get noticed in a noisy world with special emphasis on finding your voice. And you can find out more at michaelhyatt.com forward slash innovate. Next week, April the 2nd, I'll be speaking at Merrimack College in North Andover, Massachusetts. It's about a half hour north of Boston. I'll be speaking on the topic of platform also. Previous speakers there have included John C. Maxwell and Sir Ken Robinson. You can find out more at michaelhyatt.com forward slash Merrimack. There's a link in the show notes, but it's M-E-R-R-I-M-A-C-K, michaelhyatt.com forward slash 
Merrimack. Finally, on April the 26th, I'll be speaking at the CEO Summit in Frisco, Texas on the topic of platform, and I'll be there with my friends Bob Goff and Francis Chan. You can find out more at michaelhyatt.com forward slash CEO Summit. And number two, the second announcement, speaking of platform, I want to remind you again about Platform University, my online membership site for helping you launch your platform and getting your message noticed. This week, I hosted our monthly live Q&A call. Our members submitted hundreds of questions. My staff went through them, collected the most often asked ones, and then we took several calls live, and we had a terrific time. But every month, we post four new sessions. Week one, We post the Masterclass interview, where I interview the world's leading experts on some aspect of platform building. Week two, the member makeover, where I evaluate one of our members' platforms and provide the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I do this as a screencast, so you can look over my shoulder and see what I see. Then week number three, I do the backstage pass, where I take you behind the curtain, reveal some aspect of my business, and how I do what I do. And then week number four, a Q&A call where you have a chance to get your specific question answered in a live conference call. And in addition to all that, we've got an incredibly active 